We've become very good friends over a fairly short period of time. Mohammed bin Salman was vetted in Washington. Every aspect of American power rolled out the red carpet for this guy. Jamal Khashoggi was one of the only dissenting voices. To speak freely, he knew what the stakes were. Jamal was publishing articles that were critical of the Saudi regime. That could not be tolerated. To what extent was the Saudi government entangled with Al-Qaeda? Is there a person in the whole world that knows more than Jamal Khashoggi? He'd made a huge sacrifice, his children are being held hostage. You are in a war, and you can't give up. You can't disappear. Those are the last words I said to him. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for the Washington Post. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this extraordinary opportunity to talk with the director and uh, writer, producer of the film Kingdom of Silence that you just saw uh, in, in the clip that opened our, our show. Um, I, I want to uh, talk first about the importance of what happened to Jamal Khashoggi to us at the Washington Post. He was our colleague. I thought a good way for us to begin would be to show you a clip from the film about the first column that Jamal published with the Washington Post back in January, uh, back in, in, uh, in late 2017 when he began his relationship with us. So if we could show that clip. Fall of 2017. Jamal was in self-imposed exile. We met, and he gave me the biggest bear hug. It was really, really warm, and then he started crying. He said, I left my country, I left my family behind for freedom, just to be free. And no one knows what that feels like more than you. I learned later that his first Washington Post article was published that hour. Saudi Arabia wasn't always this repressive by Jamal Khashoggi. We spent endless hours on the phone trying to understand the wave of arrests. Are we going to be the core of a Saudi diaspora? Al Hayat canceled my column. The government banned me from Twitter. I spent six months silent, reflecting on the stark choices before me. So, uh, so uh, Rick, uh, Rick, that's a, a powerful that's a, a piece powerful of piece uh, footage that footage reminds us that all reminds of the all. start of Jamal's career with us at the Washington Post. Uh, tonight, as all of our viewers know, we have the first presidential debate. And I want to ask you, as the director of Kingdom of Silence, somebody who spent so much time uh, looking at Jamal's life, uh, thinking about his relationship with the United States, what question you'd like to see asked of President Trump tonight about his relationship and America's with our late colleague, Jamal Khashoggi, who we believe was murdered on orders of the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman? That, that is a great question. And thank you for, for convening us here as well, David. Um, you know, I was, I was first drawn to this story because Jamal is, you know, he was one of our own. He was a journalist who was murdered by the regime uh, that um, that he was criticizing, and when one of our colleagues is killed, it feels like it falls on us to 
try to keep alive what we can of their story against the forces that would impose silence on them. Um, and uh, Trump has been a part of that story, a part of the story of impunity around uh, Mohammed bin Salman. I mean, in Woodward's recent book, he's quoted as saying that he saved Trump's ass, or he saved MBS's ass after um, after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. And really, more than anyone else on the international scene, Trump has been uh, the, a champion of uh, Mohammed bin Salman and of this relationship, in spite of the obvious and and horrific moral cost of that. So, I mean, I would like to see, uh, I would like to see this relationship um, with Saudi Arabia in which it seems that uh, imagined strategic interests and money uh, go, uh, are, are put above everything else, above everything that we consider to be our, our values as a people um, and, uh, and, and our morality. I would, I would hope that that would be talked about in, uh, you know, particularly now, um, the, uh, our role in the ongoing catastrophe that's that's happening in in Yemen. So uh, Lawrence Wright, uh, the writer and executive producer of this uh, remarkable documentary, uh, Larry is an old friend of mine. It's wonderful to see this film. What's powerful for me as someone who's been covering the Middle East since uh, 1980 is that the documentary really tells the story of America and the Middle East in a sense through Jamal's eyes. Uh, and as you say, very honestly, Jamal uh, exhibits the best and worst of the U.S.-Saudi relationship at, at different points. I want to ask you um, the same question that I asked Rick. What would you like to see President Trump ask tonight if we could put a question in the moderator Chris Wallace's mouth and say a little bit about, about this uh, extraordinary larger story of of the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, uh, as the documentary describes it. Well, thank you, David, and it's good to see you again. Um, when you pose that question to me, what I think about is the, the battle between autocracy, tyranny, and democracy. And you know, Jamal grew up in 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 a dictatorship, a family dictatorship. Uh, and he came to America and he experienced freedom. And it became his mission at the end of his life to try to bring democracy and freedom to the Arab world, which is so starved for that. And uh, President Trump has shown an affinity for tyrants uh, and has done, as far as I can tell, very little in the area of democracy promotion. So why is this? You know, what is it? Is there something about uh, the democratic system that he opposes. Uh, why? Where is America's values for you know producing democracy around the world, which was what we stood for? It was our mission in the world. Where is that now? You know, that's a, a haunting. Uh, all the more as we watch the footage of, of your documentary, Rick. Uh, I, I want to ask you about something that's in the news uh, today after. New York Times uh, expose uh, on Sunday night of Donald Trump's tax returns. One of the striking findings of the Times reporting is that uh, President Trump has $421 million in debt that's coming due over the next uh, uh, roughly four years. And there's been a lot of speculation that some of that debt may be held by Saudis, uh, friends of the of the Saudi regime of Mohammed bin Salman, I want to ask whether in your reporting for this documentary, you came across any evidence of that kind of indebtedness by President Trump to the Saudis with whom he's been so friendly. You know, I think actually uh, Larry can probably speak to this as well uh, with with um, more kind of detail than me, but certainly there is a a, a lot of smoke around the relationship between Trump and, uh, and the, the Salman dynasty. Um, I mean, there were meetings that were had uh, in Trump Tower after the Republican convention. There's this ongoing relationship with all sorts of suggestions of deals with Jared Kushner, um, the, you know, the, the uh, Westinghouse uh, nuclear plant kind of reporting that came out in the Times you know, quite a while ago that, um, uh, that, uh, that hinted at all sorts of things. I think you know, when the fully redacted or um, uh, versions of the Comey report and other kind of investigations into Trump are are finally released. Um, I think we're we're probably going to see deeper 
financial connections uh, between between Trump and between and this family. Larry, do you have any insight into this question of of whether there's any kind of personal financial connection between between Donald Trump, who as we now know has uh, ex extraordinary debt coming due, uh, and the the Saudi regime? David, it would just be speculation on my part. I agree with Rick that it's it's this the atmosphere is full of smoke and suspicion. But uh, until we see it on paper, I, I'm not going to speculate. Fair, fair, fair enough. So, uh, Larry, let me ask you to to talk about uh, one of the powerful uh, uh, moments along Jamal Khashoggi's path toward the Washington Post, towards his eventual murder, and that's the time that he spent in Afghanistan when he became close to Osama bin Laden. One of the things I really love about this documentary is that you're completely honest about his connections with yeah. the man who became the leader of Al-Qaeda. Talk a little bit about that relationship and how and why it changed in your judgment. It is really fascinating story, David. It, you know, start with, uh, you know, bin Laden going to Afghanistan. He was a rich, uh, rich boy, you know, uh, uh, came from a very wealthy, well-known family. And uh, so that was unusual. And and then uh, Jamal Khashoggi decided to go to Afghanistan as a reporter. Now, when I say the words as a reporter, you have to understand that that is actually very unusual in Saudi Arabia. The, the press as we know it is not exactly in America, is not the same in Saudi Arabia. And so to actually go and report and send, you know, in uh, stories and interview people, this was uh, really unusual. And Jamal made a name for himself. But more than that, he made a name for Osama bin Laden. Uh, it's not that he was a flack or anything, but he was reporting on this singular Saudi figure who was in Afghanistan, who had rallied all these young Muslims around him. So when when the jihad ended uh, and bin Laden went home, and, and so did Jamal, uh, bin Laden fell into a, a strange spot. Uh, you know, we used the term earlier in, in the trailer about a voice. Uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, there's really only one voice, uh, and that is the royal family. They own all the newspapers and the cable uh, TVs and so on. They they really control the narrative. But here comes Jim, here comes Osama bin Laden, and he is what I deem uh, Saudi Arabia's first celebrity. It's a category they didn't have. It was somebody who fit in between the royal family and the rest of the country. And that made him very hard to deal with. He was a voice that was uncontrolled. And to some extent, Jamal had a voice. He was one of the best known uh, reporters in the kingdom. And a lot of his, uh, you know, his fame came from his exploits in, in Afghanistan. Now, uh, he was much more aligned with the royal family than bin Laden ever was. And in fact, uh, the royal family sent him to Sudan in 1996 to try to persuade him to come back to Saudi Arabia and stop talking trash about the king. Uh, and uh, But he wouldn't do that. Uh, what happened with bin Laden is he, he turned against Saudi Arabia and he turned against uh, America. And Jamal went on uh, to try to create a space for free expression in Saudi Arabia. When I first met him in 2003, uh, soon after that, he got appointed editor of Al Watan, one of the largest papers in Saudi Arabia in Asir, where a lot of the hijackers came from. And uh, he didn't last very long there because he 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 attacked the the you know, the ultra conformist religious bias in the kingdom, and he he strove to give space for uh, free thought, and that just couldn't be uh, tolerated. That was the first time I heard uh, from people that he was under death threat. So uh, one of the. Uh really stunning passages of, of this film. And as I say, it's in part a narrative of the U.S.-Saudi relationship is, is the footage, Rick, that you comp compiled uh, from 9-11. Uh, 
uh, the, the images of the towers being hit, of people running in panic, uh, I found really searing. And I, I want to ask you about a, a theme that's implicit in this film, uh, which is that the Saudis bear some responsibility for 9-11, had some complicity in that story. 15 of the hijackers were, were, were Saudis. T talk a little bit about, about that theme as you explore it in the film. Um, yeah, it, it isn't just that 15 of the hijackers were Saudis. It's also that much of their funding came from Saudi Arabia. Um, but I think it's also important uh, to recognize, I mean, David Rondell appears in sort of as a kind of an apologist for the US-Saudi relationship and also makes the, the point that um, uh, that it, the Saudi Arabia wasn't doing this on their own, that, that bin Laden was, was created, was a creature created by the jihad, uh, by the jihad against the Soviets. Uh, and he was uh, a client of the, of the U.S. as well. I mean, the, the, the CIA and the U.S. was covertly working with Saudi Arabia to create this Islamist jihad against the Soviets. Um, so, um, uh, so we, every step of the way, the United States is kind of, um, is is in a dance uh, with Saudi Arabia, and that leads to these kind of disastrous uh, results. Um, and one of the things that was kind of a revelation to me going into this um, was the the ways that J that Jamal changed, right, and transformed. To me, this became a story of transformation and redemption for Jamal. Um, I mean, he's a, he was far more than just a journalistic observer. He was an active participant in all of these events that came to mark us and continue to mark our time. Um, but and time and again, he saw heroes who he had championed, who he'd helped create, who he defended. Um, he saw them turn into villains and found himself to be, in a way, caught up and implicated in, in horrible crimes. But he, he uh, and he was wounded by those moments uh, and he changed. Um, so one of the things that's so pointed is, is Jamal's writings about Osama bin Laden after September 11th have mixed in them this kind of sadness, bitterness, feeling of betrayal, and a, and a recognition that uh, that 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 he he needed he now had a moral responsibility to change and to and to try to play a role to kind of make amends for this thing this atrocity that he had in some way been linked to. So. And in a way, that's hopeful to me. All the way through his life, um, you know, uh, he he kept he he maintained the capacity to to change, um, uh, and that you know was very moving to me. Every every good novel, certainly every good film, has an arc of the story of the principal character, and and I, I, viewers are going to find in Kingdom of Silence the arc of. Jamal's life. I, I remember a column he wrote, I think it was a year after 9-11, that was kind of an apology uh, for what he'd seen, for the, the horror that this person had been his, his friend had, uh, had, 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 had wrought. I want to ask Larry about uh, something that was new to me in your, in your research. The film says that uh, before Jamal's death, maybe a, a, a year or so before his death, uh, the lawyers for um, uh, the families of the 9-11 victims asked to see Jamal uh, and that he agreed to go see them, uh, knowing uh, so much about the royal family and its inner workings. And there's the implication that that may have been the reason that uh, Mohammed bin Salman targeted him. Uh, talk about that and, 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 and whether you, you feel the evidence on that is, is solid, because that, that would be a, a new and striking motive. David, I don't think he really told them anything, you know, told the lawyers anything, at least in that first meeting, but he was open to talking to them, which was threatening. And, um, you know, the, the levers that, that Jamal was pulling in America were uh, very profound uh, from the Saudi perspective. Uh, one is, you know, the, the, the family suit against the Saudis had, is extremely upsetting to uh, the royal family. And the implications, I mean, even already some of the material that's been released because of that suit, it, it's very, very damning. Uh, but the other thing, David, you just can't get around you know, we, I just mentioned the voice. The Washington Post gave him a voice that he had never had before. 
And when he went to work for the Washington Post in Washington, in America, in the most prestigious newspaper, uh, or, you know, in one of the most prestigious newspapers in the world, uh, that was something that was extremely threatening to the royal family, which was not used to allowing any other Saudi to have a, a countervailing opinion. And I think, you know, those two things were probably very much on the minds of the men that decided to kill him. I remember uh, Rick and, and Larry and, and all of our viewers, the smile on Jamal's face when he would walk through the newsroom of the Washington Post, stop by to see me and other people he knew. And I, there was a way in which he just couldn't believe that here he was working for the Washington Post and publishing uh, his columns with us. Uh, Rick, I wanna ask you about uh, something I found myself uh, thinking about over the last several weeks. And that is what Jamal would have thought and written about the normalization of relations between the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain and Israel. Would he have thought this was a good thing? Would he have celebrated it? Would he have been worried about the effects on the Palestinians? What, what do you think? Um, I mean, Palestine remained one of the issues uh, that uh, Jamal, where, where Jamal would often uh, take the American line on uh, on issues where he thought that taking the American line would be useful for U.S. Saudi relations. So, as a the most glaring example of that is after at this moment after September 11th, when um, uh, when the U.S. Saudi relationship really seemed like it might be in danger, he uh, was a champion of the U.S. invasion of Iraq, um, and Saudi Arabia was one of the only countries in the Arab world to back it, and was a, a crucial part of that picture. Um, and so he uh, he became a part of that, but he never, throughout his career, ever um, was willing to embrace the American posture towards Israel. He, in his writing, he repeatedly said that this is one point that Palestine is one point at which uh, American and Saudi interests don't align. So I mean, I, I I believe that up until the end, he retained this kind of uh, idea that Palestine was. Uh, was connected in a way to the Arab Spring and to his his hopes for change in the region. Uh, I, I'm I'm curious, Larry, whether you have any thoughts about about what uh, what Jamal might have said, uh, and what he might have said about Saudi Arabia's decision not to join in the normalization, but to allow overflights by Israeli planes going between the UAE uh, and Israel. Would would he, would he have been ready for that? Do you think? I don't know. I, I was thinking as Rick was talking about, <laughs> Jamal was asked at one point, and he, he, one of the things that's interesting about him was he was constantly in evolution. And uh, he was asked about uh, Shiites. And uh, he said, you know, it's this is ridiculous that we have this, uh, this prejudice against them. They're Muslims. But on the other hand, even I would feel strange if my daughter decided to marry one and you know, he, he was taking he was allowing himself to examine his own prejudice i don't know if it would extend you know that far uh into allowing uh overflights and stuff like that but i suspect that the more that he pursued the idea of democracy in the middle east the more he would have to accommodate himself with the idea that there is democracy in the middle east and it's israel and if you want to have a friend then you're in as a Democrat, you're going to have to turn to that country. Let me ask you both one more question, and it's it's a it's a vexing one, uh, I, uh, certainly for me. Uh, Jamal was enthusiastic in the beginning about the modernization that Mohammed bin Salman was bringing to the kingdom, uh, but he became increasingly skeptical and and and, and critical uh, as he saw that kind of uh, iron fist that MBS was, was using. What would he say about the ways in which Saudi Arabia has become a more liberal society where you can go to the movies, you can uh, go to concerts, you can, women can drive, women can travel increasingly without male guardians. What, what would he say about that, do you think? Let me start with Rick and then Larry. I mean, he he did speak to much of that before his death. I mean, he em embraced these changes. 
Um, and he said it was a cruel kind of uh, Faustian contradiction that everyone was forced into, that these changes that they'd been advocating for forever uh, were being made, and yet uh, the people who, the, the, the citizens and the intellectuals and the activists who'd been pushing them uh, were even more repressed. I mean, the ultimate example of this contradiction is, of course, uh, women driving uh, through, uh, you know, uh, royal fiat. Uh, women were suddenly given the right to drive at last in Saudi Arabia. But the women who were responsible for campaigning around this and making this an issue uh, were thrown in jail. And Lujain Hathlou remains in prison, has been tortured. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, the, the message that, the, um, that Mohammed bin Salman is, is trying to send is that um, the only route to change is through him, that the country isn't ready for democracy, but uh, an enlightened prince can uh, can make change, and that's the only way that change is going to happen. So, I mean, uh, Jamal embraced the liberalization and the opening of uh, of parts of Saudi culture, um, but uh, saw that it was a it was a horrible, cruel contradiction that it came uh, at the cost of human and social rights for the people who were trying to speak and demand those changes. Larry, what yeah, what are your thoughts on this tough question? Well, it's, it the last conversation I had with Jamal was a, about six, five months before he was murdered. And uh, he came to Austin. I had arranged a, a talk between the two of us at the university. I was totally befuddled by you know, his, uh, his feelings about uh, MBS because to me, it looked like this man is making the kinds of changes that Saudis had been demanding for years, especially young people. And I, I remember when I was teaching, uh, mentoring young reporters in Jeddah. Uh, when I left, I I gave uh, all the women reporters uh, University of Texas <laughs> keychains for the day for when they would finally get to drive. And I was so elated that they were going to be able to put those keychains to work. And but but then you know, in talking to Jamal, what I began to realize is that the the kinds of trades that were being made for these reforms came at the expense of the liberty of having free opinions and that you know there's 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 a sociological concept david called the king's paradox which is if you have an all powerful king but he wants to make some reforms or people demand them once he starts to make the reforms people demand more they want more freedom. There's never a stage along the road to freedom where people want less. And so, how do you how do you keep that from happening? I think that the example is what MBS is doing to his people now. We have a number of questions that were sent in from members of the audience. I regret that we don't have a lot of time for the questions, but I'm just going to ask one to Rick. Uh, uh, viewer. Um, uh, Ellen Stearns asks, uh, what would be the best justice for Jamal Khashoggi and for his memory? Yeah, that is a, that is a question that has vexed, um, you know, all of our interviewees as well. I mean, his closest friends, you know, struggle around this. I mean, real justice, like the kind that you'd see in a court is obviously unreachable in the current political configuration we have. There was just this travesty of a trial uh, in Saudi Arabia where someone was convicted, but uh, clearly the ringleaders have escaped all of that. Um, it's, uh, it's hard to imagine there being the real kind of repercussions for the people who are responsible going all the way up to the crown prince actually facing that kind of justice. But, um, uh, you know, in, a, in another way, I mean, Jamal's struggle as his, at the close of his life, he had embraced uh, the movement for democracy of the Arab Spring in 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 the region, and um, and it was it was to kill that hope and to kill uh, that message that uh, that that he was murdered by Mohammed bin Salman and by the, the Saudi royal family. So um, keeping that story and that hope alive and that struggle alive, I think, is the kind of uh, the homage to his memory and the justice that is possible in the world that we're in today. That's, that's well said. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to, to leave it there. I want to 
urge our viewers to take the time to see this documentary. It premieres on Showtime on October 2nd, which is the anniversary, two year anniversary, of the day when Jamal, our Washington Post colleague, was murdered in Istanbul. Uh, it's, it's well worth seeing. I want to thank um, uh, Rick and, and Larry, uh, not simply for being with us this afternoon in talking about the film, but for making a film so powerful about someone uh, we cared about at the Washington Post so, so much. So thanks to you. If you'd like to watch highlights from today's program, uh, head over to WashingtonPostLive.com. You can also see our calendar of future events. Again, with great thanks to our two guests today. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist of the Washington Post. Thanks for being with us. Thank you, David.